Today's episode is one that we jumped at the chance of recording because we heard from Kay, a fantastic listening volunteer for the Samaritans. Kay has both experience of benefiting from the support Samaritan offers, as well as supporting by listening to others. And we're looking forward to hearing more about this tremendous organisation and their crucial work. So before we go any further, welcome Kay. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on today. And it is an absolutely glorious day outside and we've just been talking about how wonderful it is to have the sun back but it's equally wonderful that you're happy to share your experiences today Kay and and maybe we can start there by you telling us a bit about you and how you first came into contact with Samaritans and actually for anyone listening who doesn't know what who the Samaritans are perhaps you could tell us about that too. Though I think most people will be very familiar with the infamous Samaritan signs that let's say train stations, for example, we are often quoted as being at the end of the line. So that ties in quite well with the telephone and being at a train station, um, which is where my retrospectively, my story begins. I work in London. I live about half an hour outside of London and I commute in every day. On one of my journeys into London, um, I became very ill and developed sepsis. At the time, I didn't know what it was and I had collapsed and it was all very much of a bit of a blur for me, if I'm honest, and very overwhelming. One minute I'm on a train, headphones on, next minute I'm waking up in in a hospital bed and I found out I, I have a dog and by walking the dog, I'd been bitten by a tick and it had gone straight to my bloodstream. By the time I had passed out, it was beginning to shut down my organs, such as the speed of sepsis. It's ultimately blood poisoning. When I woke up in the hospital, I was I was physically on the mend. I was getting there, you know, my, my heart rate was up, everything was fine. But mentally, I was challenged. Um, I spoke to my doctor and said, I'm beginning to feel very overwhelmed by these feelings. And they said, well, Kay, you know, you've, you've come off a whole load of medication. It's to be understood. We can prescribe antidepressants for you. I wasn't depressed at the time. And I had the wherewithal to think that I don't want to go on more medication, which could cloud my judgment. That's a personal choice for me. I I didn't want to take any more medication. Talking therapy was the next step for me. So I looked online and at the time there was an 18 month wait list with the NHS to get an appointment. Um, through, through my job, I have private medical insurance and I did the exact same thing. And they had a six week waiting list. Um, at the time, the feelings of being out of control, there are a lot of emotions I had. Could this happen again? What if I'm not so lucky and I'm not on a train this time? And, you know, I'm just lying there. What if, what if, what if? And I was catastrophizing somewhat. So I was standing on the train platform waiting to make the journey back to Luton and I saw our sign. Um, As luck would have it that day, train was delayed. So it fell quite nicely and me just picking up the phone, I got through within three minutes and I spoke to someone and I can say without irony or agenda that person I spoke to saved my life. As as an organisation, we're very clear that we don't advise. That's not what we do. We listen. And I've learned that power in just listening to someone, giving them a safe space that's non-judgmental, actively listening. I had someone actively listening to me. That call was the call that triggered me to think, okay, there's support. There is support to be had. No one needs to feel in any terms of crisis, I mean, whatever a a crisis is to me, maybe something very different from someone else. You don't have to be actively suicidal or having suicidal thoughts to be in crisis. It is whatever your benchmark was. And I was in crisis when I when I rang them. So I spoke to this person on the phone. And then I said, "I, I, I really want to I want to carry this on, but I'm getting on the train. And she said, you know, you you can, there are other methods of speaking to us. I I didn't know that. I thought it was, I would have to go make an appointment and see someone face to face, which wasn't how I was feeling at the time. I didn't want to be sitting 
face to face to someone because it was, felt like the thoughts were cluttering up my head. And subsequently from that first phone call, I emailed and then I phoned again. And I ran speaking to the Samaritans and the wholesome support alongside the therapy I was having. And the marriage of the two became quite well to the point where I felt strong enough to break away or finish the course of talking therapy. But I knew I was supported that, oh, no, this crutch has been taken away, but I I can always phone Samaritans at, at any time, at any time all year round. That's my story. And then I thought there are, I would imagine, and now I know to be true, there are plenty of other Ks across the world or Rays or Vs even across the country who need support, regardless of what they do, what their backgrounds are, whatever. There is help to be had. And I wanted to be part of that. And that's the enjoyment I get out of doing my shifts. I do a maximum of two shifts a week and each shift is three hours and there's always perspective that I'm helping someone and in turn that's helping me. Okay that's just wonderful that you have shared all of that and there's so much within that. Firstly thank you for your honesty and sharing how you got to that space and secondly just everything you were saying I think will resonate with people when they're at a point where they want help there can be such a frustration when we're told it's six weeks it's 18 months it's a way you know it might be a week it might be a few days I think quite often we get to the point where we want help and we've made that decision and we need to do it immediately Mm. because sometimes we can lose the will in terms of that momentum to find help you know we we might stop and retract and talk ourselves out of it Mm. and that's where the Samaritans is so amazing because like you said 24 hours a day seven days a week you can call you can email and it's immediate is there anything you think people should know about contacting the Samaritans because you talked about it being you know at train stations the number being at train stations and many people might associate Samaritans with with that absolute crisis point. What do you think people should know about contacting the Samaritans if, if that's their perspective? First and foremost, people should know that or be more aware that it's a very confidential and non-judgmental conversation you'll be having with whomever you speak to. Even on the very rare occasion, if someone phones up and recognises the Samaritans volunteer, they're not obliged to speak to the person. You can put the phone down and call back again. Like I I mentioned earlier, you don't have to be at the extreme or considered um, the more extreme end of crisis. You don't have to be in that. Your crisis could be putting one foot in front of another every day, one breath at a time. As hard as it is for people to, to make the call, as soon as you make the call, you are wholly supported. Um, there's, there's lots of signposting. As I said earlier, we don't advise, but if, if you have a particular, um, if you want to talk about, let's say, for example, eating disorders, then the Samaritan volunteer, the listening volunteer can point you in the right direction of groups that will be able to help you and give you foundations and tools. So, Samaritans can listen but then the next step if you if they choose to take that is knowing that they will be supported with a a structure on how to progress and to also know that the caller is always in control whatever they choose to say or not choose to say um, it is the caller's call and we will be supporting as much as we can. That's a beautiful point to make isn't it that it's the caller's call because Again, when you're struggling and you need to reach out for help, sometimes you can feel out of control, but actually you are taking back control by having that call. And it's up to you how much you say, how little you say, how long you stay on the call, um, what you disclose. So there is an element of of you taking autonomy there when it feels like the world around you perhaps is is not giving you that. And um, often I will reflect that back on the caller If a caller were to say, I feel, okay, I feel so out of control. I don't think I can do X, Y, and Z. And I'll say, tell me what scares you about it. 
and I'll say, were you scared speaking to me today? Look, look, you, you picked up you picked up the phone. And even if you don't want to talk to me, you can do exactly the same thing on the chat facility. Um, or, you know, if, if, if it's easier for you to have a brain dump, you can do it in an email. There are so many ways. It doesn't always have to be a face-to-face -face or a phone call. Um, and there, it's a generational thing, isn't it? Generations above us, it was always face-to-face -face and phone calls. And younger generations are now on their phone the whole time. So to be able to know that you're supported, whatever age you are, I think is, is key even from what is legally classed as children upwards to people who are um, entering the next stage of their karmic cycle, there is support to be had for everyone across the board. That's wonderful to know. And you just talking about that, I I'm really interested to know who can call because I think people might have a specific age or, you know, they might think, oh, you know, perhaps I'm too old to be calling. I should have sorted this myself or I'm too young to be calling or they'll be busy. Or I think people might judge me if they know that I've called the Samaritans. Can you talk a bit about that in terms of perhaps generation or gender or ethnicity? Is there a, a particular message you'd like to get across about that? We have people from every background. I'm Asian myself. I'm Indian. I come from an Asian background. Before I became a Samaritan, my somewhat loose impression of Samaritans would be Caucasian gentlemen of a retired age, because that's how I associated it in my mind. Um, we have everyone. Honestly, to be honest, we don't really look at someone and go oh you're brown you'll be good to be a Samaritan or you know you're gender fluid you'll be good to be a Samaritan we're very inclusive of everyone as it should be everyone and anyone is welcome to go through the process as we speak to anyone and everyone who calls. That makes a lot of sense that the the listeners are representative of the people that are calling in in their you know, diverse age, gender, ethnicity. That's really interesting to know as well. And thank you for sharing what your impression was, because until you start to talk about this, and this is why we really wanted you on, is until you start to talk about it, there is a certain impression of, you know, what kind of help fits what kind of person. And I shared before when we spoke to Lucia, and that's a previous episode where we actually discussed talking about suicide or thoughts with somebody. I called Samaritans when I was around 25 and I had just moved to London. I'd split up from my boyfriend. It was the middle of the night and I felt wretched. I, I couldn't call anyone. I couldn't call a friend. I didn't want to bother my family. And actually, like you, that was a complete turning point for me because I could say some things out loud and not have someone try and make me feel better in the way that my friends or family would, but actually explore that with me. Ask me the questions. What frightens you about being on your own? What do you, you know, what would you like to do next? And sometimes that simple act of listening is the most wonderful thing that you can have. And the Samaritans do an amazing, amazing job. And they're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, you know, we couldn't be more supportive of the work that you do. So thank you. So Kay, any final words you'd like to share with our listeners about contacting the Samaritans and the difference it can make from your, you know, with your two hats, I guess, the, the first one being Kay, who called that day when you were really struggling and needed to talk to someone straight away, to Kay, who is now a listening volunteer and is on the other end of the line and is providing that support. Kay, who phoned the Samaritans, I find it easier to talk to people I appreciate that not everyone is like me and when people are going through a period of crisis talking to a stranger at the time could possibly be the most painful thing you're not sure the reaction you're going to get as opposed to if you're talking to your mum or to your dog or to your partner so Kay now the listening volunteer who has experience of it on the other side will say please get in touch whatever way suits you the most. We're here all year round. So even if you know, you're know you there on Christmas day and you're feeling a bit overwhelmed, that everyone is having a good time and you're not necessarily, and you, someone will be there to respond to you in the middle of the night. Someone will, will be there. We want to support you. That's why I do it. I want someone to feel supported the way I was because my life would be very different, I feel, 
had I not found Samaritans. That's just wonderful. And at the end of every one of these podcasts, we do say help is available. Um, We signpost people towards the Samaritans. And again, that is 116123. That's 116123. Or you can email joe at samaritans.org. Pop over to the website to find out more about other ways of contacting. And that is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And like Kay said, that's whether it's sunny outside, whether it's winter, whether it's the middle of the night, like it was when I called. Whatever time, whatever day, they are available. Kay, it's been gorgeous speaking to you. And I'm just so grateful that you shared your perspectives on this. And I know that July and July Samaritans have a huge campaign to highlight everything they do. Is there anything we as the public can do to support Samaritans? Yes, I think that if you or any of your listeners have spoken to Samaritans and found them helpful, then then share because that simple conversation with I spoke to the Samaritans and I was feeling this could save the next person's life. We also do a lot of things across um, the charity. Uh, Recently, Luton, where I'm based, had um, has the biggest one day carnival in Europe. And we had a float and we were at the end of the line of the float because we are at the end of the line. Um, And we tied it in with the Jubilee and people and volunteers were singing. We're singing in the rain, as in R-E-I-G-N. So and there's always um fundraising going on. There's brew day that was earlier this year. There's lots of initiatives. And yes, if you do jump onto our website, there's plenty of stuff, even for people who just want to to see the best way they can garner some help from us. There's lots of help to be had. That's wonderful. So please, like Kay said, if you have benefited like I did, like Kay did, start a conversation. Maybe share this podcast, maybe share a link to Samaritans, maybe share something about their July campaign because it encourages somebody else. And as Kay said, that conversation for you changed your life and it you, you could be helping someone else to take the right step. Kay, thank you so much for today. I've loved chatting to you. Thank you for having me and thank you for highlighting the work we do. Uh, July, like you said, is a very busy month for awareness for us. So thank you again for taking the time to speak to me. You're so welcome. And thank you to every single Samaritan out there for the work you do. You are all very amazing.